eye of the camera, it makes records of people, places, and events. Photography shows, shows how things happen. It lets you see the world about you right here in your classroom. It is your window on the world. Now Kodak, through photography, brings you this edition of the Screen News Digest.
the colorful ceremonies that marked her stay were themselves evidence of the deep divisions within the seemingly peaceful colony. On parade were the Hausa tribesmen of the north, devout Muslims ruled by feudal emirs. The western region was represented by Yorubas, a people known for their many gods and love of life. Last to perform were the Igbos, the proud, ambitious, fiercely independent tribesmen from the eastern region. With a sturdy economy and an active parliamentary government, Nigeria appeared ready for self-rule. And so in London, a final conference was held to ratify the terms of independence and to arrange for the orderly transfer of power. The meeting heard first from the British Secretary of State for Colonial Affairs, Lennox Boyd. We all have one objective. The furtherance of the well-being of the people of Nigeria by the creation of those institutions which will ensure to them a future based on freedom, justice, and economic prosperity. Next to speak was the Prime Minister of the Nigerian Federation, a Muslim leader and former teacher from the northern region of the country, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. He spoke movingly of his country's hopes. In 1960, the present relationship between Nigeria and the United Kingdom will be superseded by a partnership. We trust that Nigeria will be welcomed into the Commonwealth and that through the Commonwealth and the United Nations organization, Nigeria will be able to make a positive contribution to the welfare of the human race. All that now remained was Nigeria's formal declaration of independence. The day came in October 1960. All the world watched and applauded, for Nigeria seemed to represent the brightest hope the most promising example of a former colony assuming the rights and responsibilities of independence. Princess Alexandra represented the Queen in a ceremony that blended the pomp and majesty of the past with the dreams and aspirations of the future. Prime Minister Balewa accepted the Articles of Independence from Alexandra, and at last Nigeria was free to shape her own destiny and to find her own future. Abubakar Tafawa Balewa would play an important and tragic role in the infant years of the emerging nation. The excitement of a national election. This was the country's first test of unity. At stake was membership in Nigeria's Federal House of Representatives. Seats were apportioned on a population basis, with the northern region, because of its size, dominating the parliamentary body. As election day neared, thousands of ballot boxes were assembled, each carrying the symbol of a party, the name of a candidate. The voters were carefully instructed to cast their ballots by box and symbol. On election day, in towns and hamlets, eight million Nigerians went to the polls. All adult men and women were eligible to vote, and 25,000 polling stations were set up across the country. As part of the registration procedure, each of the voters had his or her index finger painted with green ink to prevent anyone from casting more than one ballot. As in the United States, voters went to the polls in their own electoral districts. When the returns were posted, a coalition government had been elected, dominated by representatives from the northern region. The Igbos of the East accepted the results grudgingly. Prime Minister Bolewa continued to lead the government on the basis of his broad electoral support and his wide appeal among the people of the fragmented nation. Having achieved independence and a shaky truce among its three major regions, 
Nigeria turned now to the problems of poverty in the rural and underdeveloped areas of the country. With the help of foreign investment, Nigeria and her people began to harness their natural resources. The country continued to be one of the fastest developing of all the emerging African states. A giant dam was built astride the mighty Niger River, and power from the project became the means of bringing change and progress to towns and villages for miles around. Textile mills and industrial plants throbbed to the rapid pulse of a quickening economy. Nigeria seemed a shining example of enlightened self-rule. But behind the outward signs of peace and progress, of free speech and free press, there was deep division. Prime Minister Balewa came under attack, and in January 1966, newspapers told of his murder by five Eastern Army officers. Six months later, in a counter coup, Northerners regained control of the federal government. Attempts to reconcile the feuding factions proved futile, and on May 30th, 1967, the Republic of Biafra embracing the eastern region of Nigeria was proclaimed. The breakaway province was immediately invaded by Nigerian army forces and a bitter civil war began. In Enugu, capital of Biafra, Colonel Ojukwu, an Oxford graduate and former governor of the eastern region, became the leader of the embattled republic. Accusing the federal government in Lagos of attempting to annihilate the Hebrews, Ojukwu told the world, we are not only fighting for our independence, but for our survival as a people. The eight million Biafrans were hopelessly outnumbered. They trained with wooden guns, they drafted women and their makeshift army, and though they fought with fierce determination, their military position worsened month by month. Within a year, Biafran territory had shrunk to less than one-third of its original size. The Nigerian army fought with a full arsenal of modern weapons supplied by England, Russia, and other European countries. The advance of the government forces was ruthless and relentless. The Biafran capital of Enugu fell. Military defeats were followed by starvation and famine. Outgunned and outnumbered, the soldiers of the secessionist province have vowed to fight to the end. But the military struggle has become secondary to what will happen to the men, women, and children who survive. Already a thousand Biafrans a day are dying of starvation. Famine is causing brain damage in countless children and threatening an entire nation. This is the price of a war that it seems will bring no real victory to anyone. Digest, living history in the classroom, was brought to you by the Eastman 